Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, open, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased you could all be with us here today. Um, we're very pleased also to welcome our presenters. We have Sylvain Pioche of the University of Montpellier 3 Hello. and just Can you hear me now? Uh, Sylvain, Jessica, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. You hear me? Okay, great. Okay, yes. Um, great. Well, okay, sorry about that. Sorry about the problems, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Carr. I am Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're very pleased to welcome everyone here today. We're particularly pleased to have our presenters, Sylvain Pioche of University of Montpellier 3 and Jessica Salon of the University of Perpignan, um, who are going to be speaking today about assessing the ecological and social performances of artificial reefs. Before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, we're going to have the presentations by Sylvain and Jessica first, and then we will move on um, to a Q&A session. Um, for the questions, you can submit them either through the webinar chat or through the Q&A panel. Um, the Q&A panel is a little easier to moderate, um, but the, with the chat, we also you have the option of making your questions visible to all the other attendees. Um, and we'd also encourage you, you, um, you are free to weigh in on questions that you see um, and provide additional information on the topic. Um, that's welcome in the chat that people are able to share with each other. We just ask that you keep um, any of the chats on topic and uh, professional. And, um, but we welcome you to share other resources that you know of and add your own expertise in the chat. Um, I will go ahead and turn everything over to Sylvain Jessica now, but thank you everyone for attending and um, welcome Sylvain Jessica. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I'm really happy to share our research uh, today with you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of the OCTO and MPA News uh, program, which is uh, very useful for my research and to create a, a community. And this community is uh, very important for me community of practice, community of insights, community of speaking to share our uh, reflection and results. Who are we for beginning? So I will start by uh, a quick presentation about my keywords. So my research topic as a associate professor in Montpellier in geography and coastal planning are about environmental impact assessment ecological engineering, artificial reef, nature-based solution, eco-design, rapid assessment methods, and also citizen participatory and how to um, co-design the project. We call that the co-construction. I, um, uh, I am involved in artificial reef since my PhD, uh, and I've got uh, more than 40 scientific publications and a few examples for the last two years uh, with uh, nature sustainability uh, proceedings of the civil engineering, engineers, maritime engineering, regional studies in marine science about design material, but also uh, social and ecological assessment. To share my experience uh, during my PhD, I was uh, in the Tumsat University in Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, and for me. It was a tipping point in my research about artificial reef because in Europe, we separate artificial and natural uh, construction. In Japan, it wasn't the same. And I have discovered the, the mix between social and, social and cultural activity around the sea. And also this idea about how to cultivate a kind of agriculture of the sea like we have in Europe, in Occidental area, but I have never been informed before to, to, to make my PhD in Japan. My experiences in deployment and assessment uh, can be um, 
can be can take uh, their uh, legitimacy on uh, 13 artificial reef project as as director or as an expert in Indian Ocean, Atlantic uh, Ocean, and in Mediterranean Sea. I have designed and uh, realized uh, more than uh, 600 artificial reefs submerged. And you've got here in the presentation some of my uh, production and also a projected uh, design like for this offshore windmill pole in the center of the slide. My main research results of interest for today are around which house for which species. I mean that I was very, since my uh, I was a child and a, a diver, I was very uh, surprised about the why a fish will find this habitat in particular fitted for uh, its uh, needs and why not this other one? And I have, during my uh, freediving uh, activities, uh, like uh, spearfishing or freediving with, uh, with friends and colleagues, see that uh, different fishes are living in different kind of habitat. There is not one size fit all for all the species. And this is one of my interest in my research is to finally try to mimicking, like a biomimicking approach, the design of this uh, habitat, the, the depth, the wide, the high, the long, uh, the position in front of the current, in protection with the current, the material, the roofness, um, and, and so on, to adapt to uh, the fish needed. Naturally, I have uh, following my research about the ecological relationship between fishes and natural habitat. And here during my dives, you can see different fishes in different position inside a rock, just uh, in front of the rock under a boya of, uh, of uh, the grouper on the top, uh, on the top left. And I have developed a theoretical uh, uh, concept uh, the roots are uh, in Japan with the Nakamura uh, publication in uh, BMS in uh, 1985 about a classification of the fishes between type A to type C and now D uh, or E in the last publication of this research, which are adapted to uh, a kind of uh, habitat. They need this uh, higher, this position, as I said, and you will never find a type A fishes in a type C habitat. I have translated this uh, research into a table of artificial design. Here, you've got a synthesis of this table. You can find it in, in a book that I published with a colleague in 2021. Uh, where we, we, in this table, you can see very uh, synthetically uh, the main interest with uh, the size of, uh, of an artificial reef. I have also, uh, I have also product a catalog of uh, design and target spaces in stage with more than uh, 300 kind of artificial reef, the size, the weight, but also what are the targeted species, type A, B, C, D, or E, as I said, and for juveniles or adults. I have also followed uh, research about uh, what kind of uh, material for artificial reef construction to enhance the colonization. So I have developed a project about the pH on the surface, the cement, cement component of a concrete with oyster crush, fertilizer, etc. The hydrophobicity or the roughness. And by the end, if I can uh, uh, make a, yes, a synthesis of, re of this research, in fact, the, the stronger effect uh, for the colonization is the roughness of the surfaces. And this roughness will also avoid some invasive species uh, issue. 
I also developed since eight years for the French Ministry of Environment, a rapid assessment method where uh, Jessica will uh, more deeply explain uh, why they are interesting for the social ecological assessment. And this rapid assessment method can help to uh, assess with a single score the gain or the losses of biodiversity due to a different kind of uh, artificial reef or any submerged artificial structure like uh, a dike, a pipeline or offshore wind. After this uh, introduction of uh, my research and uh, main results, what about artificial reef today? What can we say today? Firstly, of course, a definition to be uh, in the same track altogether today for this uh, presentation in this evening in France. Uh, so an artificial reef is a submerged or partly submerged structure deliberately placed on the seabed to mimic some function of a natural reef protecting, regener regenerating, concentrating, and enhancing population. It will serve as habitat that function as part of a natural ecosystem. And I have kind of pictures of this. And what is not the term excludes artificial reef, cab cables, pipeline, platform, mooring, etc., which are primarily constructed for other purpose, as well as the fish aggregate aggregation devices, FAD, employed to um, like a fishing tool. The original concept historic rules are uh, for the first track track sorry in um, uh, stone uh, uh, graph um, in uh, fine in Mediterranean area was three thousand years ago uh, with boulder rocks <clears throat> put in the water to attract uh, rocky fishes. And the first national policy, so at a national level, to enhance marine productivity is fine in Japan during the Joe Emperor Chronicles uh, 400 years ago, with wreck full fight with rocks to be sunk uh, to be sunk to create a new fishing area. What are the main material and purpose? Uh, the first in the world is a concrete, then a rock or natural rock. And the third is the steel. And you can have on this uh, presentation from Seaman and Sprague in 1981, a few representation of what uh, can be found before uh, 2000 with artificial reef uh, projects from cube to a pipe or petroleum platform uh, reused as artificial reef or directed vessel adapted to be artificial reef. The main purpose, ecological purpose, are around, uh, of course, faunal enhancement. Uh, then for fisheries, artisanal, artisanal, commercial, recreational, or mixed. Habitat enhancement or rehabilitation, restoration, and the protection against mainly anti-trolling. And also for tourism, like scuba diving, and finally, science and scientific uh, research. The general goals, because we are speaking from the viewpoint of social and ecological, uh, uh, it's not a miracle solution. This is not uh, the, the best way to, to find uh, all, um, all the answer about uh, uh, poor management or uh, uh, fishing uh, through exploitation, because it needs a clear goal before and adapted management for production, protection, recreational, or restoration. And you can find all these uh, goals, for instance, on this presentation, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the spatial, spatial planning is very important for artificial reef project. And uh, this is one of the secrets of the success, which uh, Jessica will, will uh, explain uh, after my presentation. Just to illustrate uh, where you can find some very good example of uh, the three main goals of uh, artificial reef. The, in Portugal, the fisheries uh, productivity uh, start uh, during the 80s in the south of Portug Portugal in Algarve area. 
with this kind of artificial reef directly inspired from a Japanese structure and with a bunch of juveniles and uh, more than 40 years of uh, research, 30 or so, sorry, of research. Um, so the, the amount of uh, productivity was uh, multiplied by 2.2 points. The, there is also an increase of uh, diving activities from 15 to 20 percent for very low operating cost and uh, experience of restocking uh, with Sebring. Another example in US, for instance, the recreational and touristical uh, uh, goal for artificial reef. In Florida, there are more than 2,500 uh, recreational artificial reef sites since the 70s. Uh, uh, and uh, this artificial reef area um, create for the local economy a 180 recreation site for 200 million uh, US dollars with 2,600 uh, jobs and the expense per day are around 300 uh, US dollars. In Japan, as you can see, there is an integrative uh, application of artificial reef with the marine ranching. Uh, with aleotic and restoration, with many kinds of reef. And today, uh, there are more than 20,000 uh, sites for 12% of the coastal area uh, uh, with artificial reef. More than 300 models. And uh, uh, in 2007, 600 $650 million US invested by the public party. And at this amount, you can additional uh, local community and fishermen to, uh, to create artificial reef area. Finally, is it a good answer? Yes, but of course. I have put in this uh, slide uh, three very interesting and recent uh, paper, uh, Artificial Reef Around the World, or review of the state of the art and the meta-analysis of its effectiveness for the restoration of marine ecosystem, where Braco and Villa Vicencio explain that there are very few uh, returns, but most of them can explain that artificial reef reach the, the goal of restoration. The second one, artificial reef in the Anthropocene, a review of geographical and historic, historical trend in their design purpose and monitoring by RAM, made an assessment of where, of where and why artificial reef were made. And last but not least, uh, Baptiste Vivier, uh, with a marine artificial reef, a meta-analysis of their design objective and effectiveness. Uh, clearly explain that the productivity, the protection, and the restoration uh, can be uh, achieved with artificial reef under specific management uh, approach. There are also failure due to mistake, mistakes in their use. So uh, you can pretty sure that you know the, the issue of artificial reef with tide in Florida, the Osborne Reef. Also, PCB pollution or oil spill due to wreck not, not correctly uh, washed before the uh, sink. Invasive species also supported by smooth surfaces on concrete, steel, or plastic uh, used to be artificial reefs. Uh, impact on hydrodynamic, aesthetic degradation on the, on the picture on the, on the right uh, bottom, for instance. Um, a very interesting paper also about the ecological trap if the design of it of artificial reef is not uh, uh, adapted to the fish, which could enhance the mortality. And uh, last, decommissioned platform uh, has uh, controversies over attraction and production because you can find a top or big predator. And there are several papers in Southeast Florida with uh, Richard Spiller and uh, Robbins which are very interesting about that. To finish, this is a new field of research, um, uh, very interesting uh, with the connectivity pathway and explain uh, to uh, decision maker that uh, any, um, 
any construction put in the water will be colonized, artificial reef or over artificial construction. And they will, they will be in interaction with natural rocky area or sea grasses or, or the seafloor. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this consequence need to be uh, assessed before to uh, put anything in the water. And I will finish with this very interesting presentation about uh, Paxton in Natural Sustainability in 2024. They found that uh, in US, um, even if the permitted artificial reef uh, zone on the seafloor are about uh, 5,800 uh, kilometers square, the cumulative footprints of the uh, real uh, footprint of artificial reef is only uh, 19 uh, kilometers square, which is uh, 300 hundred times less than the permitted area which meaning that 19.67% of the permitted zone already obtained in US are still available for artificial reef deployments. And they finally com compared, finally, I found it very interesting that this is for the south southeastern US area, uh, the artificial reef footprint represents less than 0.01% of that of natural reef and only cover 2.57% of the continental shelf, which is between 10 to 200 meter depth. The map of the world uh, publication about artificial reef, so it's widely spread around the world. The top in the world is Japan, and just after US, then Europe and Brazil and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And as you can see, the publication are growing uh, about artificial reef since uh, more than 50 years uh, from today. The recent interest about artificial reef is due to ecosystem, UN decade for ecosystem restoration, but there is a need about the part B where I let Jessica, my colleague, explain how she developed a method to assess the social and ecological uh, gain of artificial reefs. Yeah, thank you, Sylvain, for these introdu introductions. Um, I will just like, yeah, sharing my screen. So I think it's okay now. Yeah, it looks great. And I just want to remind everyone that you can go ahead and send in questions either through the chat uh, or through the Q&A panel of the webinar. And then we'll field them after uh, Jessica and, and Sylvain uh, are done with their presentations. Okay, off to you, Jessica. Thank you, Sam. So now in this part B, I will address the question of why we can say that artificial reef have met social and ecological goals and how they achieve these objectives. So here with Sylvain, we aim to present to you the methodology we have developed during my PhD to assess social and ecological system with artificial reef. So I will present in you some of the key results from our research through case studies located in France. And currently I pursue this research on social ecological assessment, but now focusing on MPA, also located in French overseas, but uh, French overseas territory. So, also, these are some overview of the research on the use of social ecological system approach. That is a newly investigation field for artificial reef, but that is more and more used in this field. So as you can see with these recent uh, research papers that uh, also use a social ecological system approach to and apply to artificial reef. So first, I will explain how we define the goals of artificial reefs. So as Silva explained to you, artificial reefs come about various goals, uh, such as protection, production, recreation, or restoration. And regardless of these goals, several components are required to implement them. So we can divide it into two groups, these uh, requirements. So the first group is the social requirements, that are composed of authorization, financial support, scientific and technical support, the public acceptance, but also a need of a project manager to lead the implementation. And the second group 
is the, uh, the ecological requirement. So that means that artificial reef need the fauna acceptancy to be effective and so need to be designed and to, to be put in the location in accordance with the ecological and functional needs that are the, protect, the need of a protection or refuge, but also an area where they can grow, reproduce, and feed. So then, uh, for each uh, need, different stakeholders uh, that could be human or no human are identified to provide these needs. And for example, if we take the authorization requirements, this will be delivered by national authorities, which could be marine agencies or national government services. And when the stakeholders are involved, they will bring their own interests or conditions to the project being implemented. So if we keep our example, uh, we can see that uh, the national governments have interest in ensuring uh, human security, but also uh, protect uh, the habitat and the marine fauna. Uh, of course, this is linked uh, with their role because they, they, they want to control and verify that any marine project didn't destroy habitat or present a risk to human life. So if we're doing so for each stakeholder, we can see that emerge five social interests, such as economic, cultural knowledge, human security, social collection and relationship between users and a local value for the territory. And three ecological uh, interests that are the habitat, but uh, also uh, the increase of uh, uh, fauna, like marine fauna with the abundance and the richness, and a growth and reproduction of species. So if each stakeholder has different expectations, it's not a problem because they will come together in a common project under a general goal for artificial reefs. So by doing so, we can say that the artificial reef challenge is to meet everyone's expectations. So now that we have seen what are social and ecological expectations, we will link them to each uh, goal of artificial reef. So under the protection uh, project, stakeholders usually expect protection of habitat, of course, uh, but also uh, protection of the marine fauna and also a social one, a human, like the human security. For the production goal, stakeholder will expect the growth of and reproduction of species, but also an increase of uh, income and a social connection between users. For the recreational goal, stakeholder will expect an increase of available habitat for species with an increase of their biodiversity, and in the social part, an increase of income and a better value for the territory. And for the last goal, that is the restoration project, stakeholders have similar ecological interests than the recreational one. And for the social part, uh, they will uh, expect enhancement of knowledge on how the ecosystem works. So as we can see, each main goal combines both social and ecological expectations, showing that the interest in artificial reef projects are multiple and diverse. So now that we have seen that under the main goals of artificial reef, there are both social and ecological expectations, let's look at how we can assess them. So uh, in this part, I will show you why assessing social and ecological system is important and how we can do it. So first, you have to understand that assessment is an important part of artificial reef project because it will determine the success or failure of the project. So if you think about the definition of artificial reef that Sylvain gave you, that said that artificial reefs are intentionally implemented structure. Therefore, the aim of the assessment is to determine whether the artificial reef achieved these intentions. 
And so we also have seen that there are social and ecological expectations under the main goals of artificial reef. So the aim of the assessment is to assess the social and ecological efficiency and impact of artificial reef. There are various stakeholders that could benefit uh, from the assessment. So they could be decision makers, environmental agency, or local government, because they can use the assessment data to create policy or regulations, but also uh, the users, like the fishing community, because they will benefit directly from the increase of fish stock, for example, but they can adapt their uh, fishing practice to be more sustainable, etc. Uh, so at this point, we see that uh, it is uh, that the assessment is important to prove that artificial reef projects are beneficial to all stakeholders, and so they can benefit from it. So consequently, the success or failure of artificial reef will depend on the assessment process that you will choose. Oh, sorry. And so here, uh, we wanted to present you an assessment framework uh, adapted specifically to artificial reef and was defined by Simon and Jensen and further developed by Claude. So the static point of this framework is to specify the general goals of artificial reef. And then uh, you work out the threshold of the success. That means, for example, detailing which species you, and how many you expect to be on artificial reef. So when you have done that, the second step is to choose indicators adapted to specific objectives. So these are examples of social or ecological specific objectives you can choose. So you can choose to focus on ecological impact such as invasive species or pollution or topographic perturbations. Um, but you can also you, uh, choose to use the assessment to verify that the management decisions are aligned with the social expectations and so doesn't create conflict or you can verify that user comply with the rules you implemented, etc. And then I added you some example of indicators. So for ecological indicator, you can have the species diversity, the abundance, and the social one, you can have the income or the number of users. So if we go back to the assessment framework, the third step uh, consists in monitor and gather the data to calculate each indicator. Again, various tools can be used to monitor um, and also are available in different guidelines. So these are examples of existing guidelines for artificial reefs. So the first one referred to the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, whereas the second one focuses on the Southwest Florida. And I also gave you some examples of ecological monitoring that can be traditional with the fishing survey or underwater visual sensors. Or, more, or using more technical material with the, like the video survey or acoustic. And for the social monitoring, you can organize questionnaire, interview, for example, and so on. So once again, if we going back to the assessment framework, you will be finally uh, be able to assess uh, artificial reef uh, by comparing the calculated indicator with the threshold that you have fixed in step one. And by doing that, for each specific objective, you provide a global assessment of artificial reef and validate the success or failure of your project. So now if we look at what is done in the field and what kind of assessment are de developed, we see that traditionally three types of assessment exist. The first one focuses on verify colonizations and development. The second one, um, for, uh, comparing the natural habitat with artificial reef. And the third one, uh, assess, um, evaluate the efficiency of artificial reef uh, that involves comparing different types of artificial reef to see which design is most effective. 
if we still look at what is done on the field by using uh, French uh, artificial reef as an example, we explore what kind of monitoring for assessment is done in France. And in synthesis, we see that the most frequent type of monitoring are the fish community and the structural checkup for artificial, artificial reef. Whereas the, there are very few social assessments in yellow uh, concerning the economic or the number of users. So this review reveals assessment issues that are also confirmed by other researchers and are first, the lack of social data. So social and economic impacts are often overlooked and leaving a gap in the comprehensive assessment process. The second one is the lack of clear and quantitative objective for both social and ecological goals meaning that the first step of the framework I show you is not fully implemented. And the third issue is the complexity of habitat that make it difficult the comparison with the natural system. So this issue illustrates that typical assessments don't capture the overall efficiency of artificial reef because social interests are not measured uh, at all, and ecological interests are only partially measured. So that can explain why some stakeholders can be frustrated if they expect social outcome, and also explain why some projects failed. Another reason of the success or failure of artificial reef projects rely on the interlinked dependency between the social and ecological system form, forming a loop that I will now illustrate to you. So when you implement artificial reef, you expect that the artificial reef support the colonization by benting fauna, then fishes. That is what I call uh, the ecological interest and will provide positive ecological outcomes. And these ecological outcome will support social ecological interaction like economic activities and then knowledge, etc., that are generally known as ecological services. And that uh, lead to fulfilling the social interest that I described you at the beginning of my presentation. But these social ecological interactions also affect the ecological system in return. And so for the system being sustainable and works, you need to find a balance between social and ecological benefits. And by doing social assessment, uh, you will be able to detect change in human behavior and also adapt the rules or managing practices to ensure this balance. As well as by doing ecological assessment, you will be able to detect change in marine fauna characteristics and also adapt the rules or managing practices. So with this interdependency, we see that it is needed to assess both social and ecological outcomes. Uh, and now we will see how we can do it. So here we want to introduce you uh, an assessment process that provide this symmetrical analysis between the social and the ecological system using a before and after uh, comparison. So the initial step of this methodology is to evaluate the state before and after artificial reef implementation with indicator, and then quantify potential benefits or losses by doing the differences between the two states. So we combine this approach with social and ecological network analysis to characterize the state before and after artificial reef implementation. So you have to know that network analysis is based on two components that are the nodes and the relationship between the nodes. But the relationship between humans are governed by social concepts that are not applicable to non-human actors. Therefore, two types of network analysis are necessary to holistically analyze the social ecological system. So the first type is the social network analysis. So in this context, 
a node will represent the stakeholders and the link uh, represent their interactions. That could be information flow, technical or material flow, etc. And the second type is the ecological network analysis. This is a well-known method that involves uh, modeling traffic network using Ecopass uh, with Ecosim. So by using this network analysis, it will help us to understand and describe uh, the system functioning, but also can reveal some emergent properties and also uh, offer numerous indicators that will be useful for the assessment process. So here's some example of indicator provided by the social network analysis, and I link them to the social uh, outcome they can measure. So for example, the first one, the flux density, that is the measure of the number of interactions can measure the increase of monetary or information flow. And so being used to assess if artificial reef announce knowledge and increase uh, income. Here, the same uh, example with the ecological indicator. So the first one, for example, the total system throughput, that is the sum of the flow in the system, uh, can be used to measure the system activity and assess if artificial reef participate in producing biomass and transfer in higher trophic level. So here is an illustration of this assessment process. So first you have the area before artificial reef that is characterized by social and ecological interactions that we can assess through the indicators I show you. Um, so here we just uh, selecting four uh, indicators for the, for the illustrations. Then when you implement artificial reef, you also choose some managing rules that will affect the social and ecological system. And after that, you have the area with the management rules, choices, and um, the new uh, ecological, social ecological interaction. And what we can see here is that with the implementation of artificial reef, uh, there is an increase of the uh, tot total sum of flow with um, uh, ecological parts, but uh, there is no differences in the diet dependency between the species, that is the system omnivore index. We see that the number at the value are the same. Uh, but with the social part, we see that uh, the rules affect the fishing activity and the number of fishermen inside the area decrease, but the managing process that implement monitoring will increase information and flow uh, between users. So the comparison between the two states show the trends that express which are beneficial or not. So to apply this kind of approach, uh, further re research will be needed to make it easier to fulfill, uh, costly and also rapid to obtain. So now we can move on with the next part and we will see uh, what we have learned from a social and ecological assessment to make a good project. So we apply our approach on 10 artificial reef sites located in France. And our results show that all ecological scores are positive, showing that artificial reef have the capacity to provide functional habitats. So we use the social score to differ differentiate uh, artificial reef efficiency. And what we can see is that uh, six artificial reef provide several social benefits, meaning that they fulfill several social expectations like economic, knowledge, territorial value, et cetera. Uh, whereas one site only provide one social benefit and three didn't provide any supplementary social benefit. So these results show that if we only do the ecological assessment, all artificial reefs seem to be successful. 
But if we combine with social assessment, we see that three artificial projects fail to fulfill social expectation. And the risk of this social failure is that if um, it can lead to conflict between user with lack of compliance, but also can affect the funding obtained for the management, for example. It will also affect uh, the interest of local governments. And from this artificial project, we have observed several key aspects that only are present within projects with social benefits. So firstly, there is a high number of stakeholders in, involved in this project and a high level of interactions. So that means that there is collaboration between them, but also a large um, diversity of expertise that can contribute to the implementations. We also observe that in all sites um, that provide social efficiency, the governance play a crucial role and impose some restrictions of users. And lastly, uh, the governance planning is also integrated into a broader territorial plans that ensure that artificial reef goals are aligned with other and larger environmental strategy. So now I will detain you step by step uh, each uh, enabling uh, condition that we have been identified based on various uh, study for the implementation of artificial reef. So for the first stage, that is the initiation, initiation stage, uh, co-construction with expert is important for the social acceptance. That means that stakeholders participate through debates involving uh, invited experts from various sectors like fisheries, association, or local authority, or also private sector. And the discussions provide a co-decisions making and ensure the acceptance of the project. The second one is the need of an agreement on precise social and ecological objective. So that is the first step of the assessment process I, I will show you. So stakeholders need to reach consensus on the specific definitions and objective concerns both social and ecological aspects. So this clarity ensures alignment and focus through the project. Then during the implementation stage, the planning and budgeting for management need to be developed. So this step involves outlining strategy, allocating resources, or setting timelines to achieve the desired outcomes. And the second key point at this stage is the designations of a manager and their responsibility. So the selected manager should be designated for his skills and commitment to fulfill the project objectives. Finally, at the management stage, it is uh, necessary to establish ongoing monitoring of social ecological dynamic to provide data that will make it possible a regular assessment process that we have been is crucial for understanding the system resiliency and adapting management strategies. And last but not least is the importance uh, to implement strong communications uh, strategy to engage the public and stakeholders through all the projects, project life, life cycle, sorry. And um, it could be education program that could be done and that will help foster understanding and support among the community. So that's finished. I hope to have convinced you to understand the importance of doing social and ecological assessment of artificial reef and that artificial grid can be an efficient solution to your problem. So thank you for your attention. We are now moving to the question section with Sarah, I think so. And Silva and I will be delighted to answer any questions you may have. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, Jessica and Silva, this was wonderful uh, to get, I mean, such a good overview of, of what we should be doing with artificial reefs and then the current status of our, 
Dr. Reese. We we really appreciate this. So we do have some questions, and um, if other if others have questions, I'd encourage you to send them in either through the chat or through the Q and A. Um, we'll get started with one that came in earlier. Are you aware of any example of the use of eDNA techniques to assess ecological impacts? Yes, of course. We we did use it in um, assessment of uh, protected species, which are difficult to find. Uh, and uh, we used eDNA for um, a French protected uh, giant mussel called uh, called uh, Pina nobilis. But we we still have some um, issues with uh, reconnect recognition about the eDNA sequences with very uh, close species of uh, different kind of uh, muscles. But yes, we, we start to think about that and uh, I'm pretty sure that it's a good idea to assess uh, the, uh, the ecological impact with the presence or absence of uh, protected species, for instance, or very important uh, targeted species for fisheries also like a lobster or uh, very difficult to see uh, during the day and uh, visual uh, senses if there is not a fishing trap, for instance. Okay. Thank you, Sivon. Um, another question that came in, how do you define your before baseline? For example, is it 10 years ago, 100 years ago? And this yes. was asked during Jessica's, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we usually speak about that with Jessica. Uh, we think, for because we are geograph, that this is a social consensus for us. So uh, uh, for us, the before baseline is the, the moment commonly defined by all the stakeholders, policymaker, MP manager, uh, scientists, uh, uh, fisher, fisherman, recreational. So... For us, it's, it's a co-construction uh, uh, time mm -hmm. that has to be uh, globally accepted by all the stakeholders and not something uh, like, uh, like uh, she said about uh, 10 years, 100 euros, which doesn't mean sense uh, today. Okay. Thank you, Sylvain. Um, another question. One key applied question is, should infrastructure be allowed to remain in the water after its useful life? For example, oil rigs or wind turbines. How can your results on intentional artificial re reefs inform that debate? Mm. Uh, of course, mm, if, like said Jessica, and she underlined this aspect, the artificial reef are deliberately uh, put in the water with before the, the installation uh, knowledge about the, the size, the material uh, construction, so the roof nets concrete with specific uh, holes, pits for fauna and flora. From my point of view, if there is no uh, invasive species development or any issue with, uh, I don't know, um, connectivity uh, disruption, artificial reef can't le can let be uh, uh, lie under the sea. And this is not the same with uh, offshore windmill pole or pipeline, which is not uh, designed to, to stay under the water. And there is no consideration for the ecological integration. And this is interesting because as you know, there is a growing uh, research uh, about a green gray infrastructure, eco-design, nature inclusive infrastructure. And uh, this could help the, the debate about, uh, can we let under the water uh, a human artificial construction and from my point of view, it could be yes, if they are designed before the installation for ecological purpose. Okay, thank you, Sylvain. Um, going back to um, one of the first questions we got, 
what should be the relationship between artificial reefs and marine protected areas? Can artificial reefs be used as protected area for meeting the requirements under global biodiversity framework target 30 by 30? And this is for Jessica. Her <laughs> PhD and her postdoctoral is about that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, in fact, in France, uh, most of the time, they are on artificial reef side, there are management practices that are uh, restricted users. So they are like uh, MPA, and also um, there are other places that uh, are MPA with uh, that implement uh, artificial reef. Um, so they are they can be combined um, they are in the they can be with the both uh, purposes but artificial reef also are implement to um as um i don't know the word in english as um with fish uh i don't know en français c'est quoi um comme Pas mesure compensatoire, mais comme, uh, ah, like uh, mitigating, yeah, like yeah. a mitigation uh, measure. Yeah, with fishermen, with the discussion uh, with fishermen. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Um, let's see, we we have several, I mean, we have some really excellent questions, and so we'll try and get to as many as we can in the next few minutes. Um, one, uh, uh Next, our next question, for one bay in Mexico, we are planning to develop a blueprint for mapping the places at which artificial reefs could be beneficial. What would be your best advice to us for doing things correct from the beginning? Hmm. Uh, I think it's very important to analyze the before uh, any artificial reef installation connectivity pathway and uh, to be able to assess uh, where put an artificial reef can help the connectivity for which species at which step of development, juveniles, adults, spawning area. In fact, it's to make um, uh, an assessment about the, the, the potential, natural potential of the area. And... Uh, as I can see in Japan, they use artificial reef from very shallow water, less than a 10 centimeter of water for the post larvae, to a 200 meter depth during a spawning time of, uh, or, uh, or during the winter time when the fishes are going back uh, deep to the sea. And to see if uh, put additional artificial reef can help the uh, uh, the uh, completion of these uh, cycles, these uh, life cycles. Okay, thank you, Sylvain. Um, what well, is possibly our last question? We have found that public perception of living shorelines tends to be positive, while perception of artificial reefs, largely due to the term artificial, leans more negative despite mm -hmm. the two types of structures being quite similar. Do you have any tips for how to pr improve perceptions of artificial reefs in communities? Hmm. It's a very good question. Um, yes, clearly this term is awful, artificial reefs. Uh, maybe we can uh, slowly go to habitat, firstly. So maybe speaking about uh, bio mimicking or bio mimic habitat, for instance. And definitely the idea of uh, shift the world for nature-based solution, nature-inclusive design, green green infrastructure. As we can, as we say in France, uh, to uh, to uh, pour noyer le poisson. How can we say in English to uh, I don't know to to kill the fish? <laughs> uh, it could be a good way to 
to avoid this very bad uh, past uh, perception about artificial reef. We need to speak about habitat. We need to speak about biomimicking. We need to speak about landscape aesthetical integration because uh, it's true that in the past uh, put a, a square or a cube uh, in the middle of a beautiful landscape with natural uh, um, feminine uh, shape under the water for me it's a mistake uh, and yes wow. we, we have to think about that commonly well, that's good advice and, and good terminology that we could start mm. moving to. Um, we are at the end of our time. Thank you so much, Sylvain and Jessica, for this fantastic presentation and overview. Mm. Um, several of you have asked for the PowerPoint presentation. We will be able to share it in the next couple of days. So um, I have the names of those who have asked in the chat. Um, but if you can also shoot me an email and I'll, I'll have that at sarah at octogroup.org if you are interested in it. Um, and we will be providing all the questions, uh, whether we will, especially those that we were not able to get to, to Silva and Jessica so that they can see them. Um, and we appreciate everyone who was able to attend and all your work for improving the marine uh, environment. And we really appreciate all the time you spent uh, putting this presentation together and uh, for us. We really appreciate you doing that, Sylvain and Jessica, and we wish you all the best with your future research. And thank you everyone who attended, and we will hope to see you on future webinars. Of course. Okay. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, and thank you very much again, Sarah, and thank you, Jessica, for your help. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you. See you. Bye.